Hi, thank you for streaming one of our latest messages here at Mountain Lake Church. We hope you enjoyed the message. Please come back again very, very soon. We know that life change stories happen. They happen every day. And at Mountain Lake Church, we want to hear about your life change story. If you'd like to share your story, please visit us at mountainlake.tv and click on the story button. You can also find service locations as well as times. And if you can't come to see us in person, please know that we stream our services every Sunday at 9, 10, 30, and noon. We look forward to seeing you this weekend. The next generation is extremely important. I think we can all agree on that, whether you're a church person or not. It doesn't really matter what side of the political aisle you fall on, what your upbringing is. The next generation is important. They're going to be our next teachers and doctors and preachers and government officials. And they're going to be over our HOAs and and they're going to be leading things. And so the next generation is important and, and we care about the next generation. We want to see them be successful. We want to see them lead. We want to see them live functional lives. And so to do that, we give the next generation certain things. We give them an education, or we give them experiences, or we give them a trust fund, or we give them opportunities, or we give them a connection. We give them these things because we want them to to be successful, to be functional. And when I say the next generation, it's the obvious son or daughter, or grandson or granddaughter, but... But different than that, it's, it's older sibling to younger sibling. It's father-in-law to son-in-law, mother-in-law to, to daughter-in-law. It's that, it's that neighborhood kid that seems to be spending five nights a week at your house that really considers you more family than their own family. It's that next generation of your family. It's the people that are younger than you that are coming up. If you're part of the greatest generation, it's pouring into the baby boomers. If you're a baby boomer, it's pouring into Gen X, Gen X to millennials. High schoolers to middle schoolers, middle schoolers to elementary schoolers, elementary schoolers into the family dog. I just pour, just pouring into to that next generation. We care for them. And so we give them these things. We give them these education opportunities. Trust me, we give them these things. If you're a grandparent, but you give your grandkids whatever they want. Amen. Amen. And yeah, I mean, Brianna, I talk about that. Whenever her parents or, or, or my parents leave, our kids have to go through a three-day grandparent detox. <laughs> I mean, they have to re, relearn the word no. Like that's got to go back in their vocabulary and, and candy's not a food group and you don't get a random toy on Tuesday afternoon. Every so we have to teach them these things. And, and there's nothing wrong with, with wanting to give the next generation things as education or, or opportunities or just trust funds. There's nothing wrong with that. I think the heart behind it is good. But you and I both know adults, men and women that have been given all of these things. Education, opportunities, trust funds, jobs, connections, and they, they still don't seem to have any more joy than the next person. They don't seem to have any more hope, any more purpose, and maybe for some of them, they really aren't functioning adults in, in our society. And we scratch our heads and go, they had everything. They had every opportunity, every type of education, the best education, an unlimited trust fund, an un- unlimited vacations, great memories, what happened. And today we're going to talk about the thing to give to the next generation of your family. The the thing that will last longer than a trust fund or education or opportunities. And it's this this thing that that really hinges upon you. And we're going to look at it through, through the lens of a letter that was written to a young man who was in the next generation. The young man's name was Timothy, and in our New Testament, Timothy has two personal letters written to him. And so it's important to understand who this letter was written to, but but maybe more importantly, it's important to understand who wrote it and what the circumstance was when he wrote it. The guy that wrote these letters to Timothy was a guy named Paul, the Apostle Paul. Planted churches around the Mediterranean Rim, wrote a large part of the New Testament. And 2 Timothy is an interesting letter. It's very different than all the other letters that you would read in the New Testament. 
It's a very different tone of voice in the way he writes. And the reason why is because Paul knows that his death is very, very near as he's writing this. And so we almost get this look as, as Paul's last words as he's writing to Timothy. And this letter was written about 66 or 67 AD. And it's important to know that because in 64 AD, the great fire of Rome broke out. And when that happened, the emperor Nero was, was looking for somebody to put the blame on. And so he found this little group of people called Christians. And so he goes, they're at fault, blame them. And when he did that, the persecution of the Christians went through the roof. And so this is two to three years after that. Paul is in prison and he's writing this as Christians are under severe persecution as the apostle Paul is himself. And so he's writing this from prison. Now, it's easy for us to go, yeah, he wrote that in prison, but you need to understand the, the, the circumstances that he found himself in. And there's a, a prison in Rome called the Mamertine Prison where many people believe that, that Paul was at when he wrote this. And I, and I brought a picture of the Mamertine Prison and you can go there and visit it. And this is it right there. And, and obviously minus the little altarpiece, but it is this dark dirty, nasty dungeon. And I had a couple come up to me after the first service and they actually went there and visited it. And they said, Chris, that ceiling is maybe five and a half feet tall. It's this tiny, dark, damp, stinky cave that he's a prisoner at. And so he's writing to his son, Timothy. Now, now Timothy had a mother and father. His mother was Jewish and, and Timothy's father was Greek. And he met Paul and Paul adopted him essentially as his spiritual son and began to mentor him and pour into him. And this is Paul's final words. And so when you understand the context of how this was written, of, of where it was written from, it puts on a whole new lens. And you can imagine Timothy as he's reading it, knowing that more than likely these are the last words that he's ever going to read from his spiritual mentor, Paul. So with that in mind, we're going to go to 2 Timothy chapter 1. If you've got a Bible, grab it. And Paul drives home this really emphatic point, and, and you owe it to yourself to read the, the whole letter, take you 15 minutes. But we're just going to look at the, the very first part and then really close to the end as Paul closes out the letter. 2 Timothy chapter 1, we'll pick it up in verse 1. Here's what Paul writes. He says, this letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. I have been sent out to tell others about the life he has promised through faith in Christ Jesus. I'm writing to Timothy, my dear son. If you've got a pen or a highlighter, those three words. May God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord give you grace, mercy, and peace. I'm writing to Timothy, my dear son. Now you need to know that this is very, very different than his first letter that he wrote. In his first letter that he wrote to Timothy, he addressed him as his, his spiritual son in the faith. This is a much stronger term of endearment, saying, my dear son, the son whom I love. Paul would know that, that this is it. He's going, I want you to pay attention. And it's the same tone or inflection that he's trying to convey as if, if you travel on business trips for a living. If, when you go to work regular at the office, you hug your spouse and your kids, goodbye. But when you go on a business trip, three day, five day or a week, you hug them just a little bit tighter before you go to the airport, don't you? Because you know it's going to be three, four, five days before you see them again. If you've ever served in the military and you've been stationed overseas and you've been deployed for six months or a year, it's that type of hug that you're giving your parents or your spouse or your kids knowing I'm not going to see them for six months or a year. This is what he's trying to convey. Going, Timothy, my dear son, I want you to listen and pay attention. And here's what he unpacks. Look at verse three. Timothy, I thank God for you, the God I serve with a clear conscience, just as my ancestors did night and day. I constantly remember you in my prayers. I long to see you again, for I remember your tears as we parted, and I will be filled with joy when we are together again. Verse five, I remember your genuine faith. For you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I know that same faith continues strong in you. 
I want you to remember that faith, Timothy, that, that not just started with you, didn't really just start with your mother, it started with your grandmother. And the faith that first filled your grandmother and then was passed on to your mother and then is now a part of you, I want you to remember that and hang on to it. And he would say, fan into flames the gift that God has given you, but don't forget the heritage of faith. And what I want you to grasp and, and, and understand to give to the next generation of your family, kids, grandkids, younger brother or sister, or that niece or that nephew, I want you to give the next generation an example of a life of faith. Give the next generation an example of a life of faith. And here's the reason why. You will have no idea the impact that your life of faith may have on the next generation. You have no idea the impact that your faith can have on the future generations of your family. I promise you that Timothy's grandmother wasn't thinking, one of these days, my daughter's going to have a son and he's his going to be buddies with a guy who wrote a large part of this thing called the New Testament. And thousands of years from now, people will read about my name all over the globe. She just faithfully lived her life and it passed on to her daughter and it passed on to her son, Timothy. Don't ever under, underestimate the impact that your faith can have on future generations. And I know for many of you, you've got that person in your mind and they're the prodigal. They're the person that's walked away from the faith. They're the person that, gosh, you thought you did everything right and they've gone and done their own thing. Hear me carefully. You keep hoping, praying, and believing in the next generation of your family. Keep hoping, keep praying for, and keep believing in the next generation of your family. You have no idea the impact that your faith will have on your children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and the future generations. You stay faithful and you give them an example of a life of faith. This past week, Tuesday, I went to a lunch. And it was at a company up in Lumpkin County. It was called Arcadia. And they build outdoor pergolas with motorized louvers, roofs. And the guy who owns that company, his name is Scott Selzer, and he attends here at Mountain Lake, and they released a new product, and they had a little event out there, and it was lunch, so myself and, and Todd, we went out there and supported him, got the tour of the place, it was great. Visited him with him for about an hour and came home, and, and that evening got home talking to Brianna, and just kind of debriefing the day. I said, I had a great lunch today. She goes, where at? I said, well, I went out to Arcadia and, and hung out, saw the new product line, and I said, Scott Selzer, he goes here to the church, it's his company. And she goes, Mr. Scott? I was like, well, I don't really call him Mr. Scott, but she, she goes, Kara loves Mr. Scott. And I was like, what? She goes, yeah, Scott. She goes, he teaches Kara's four-year-old class on Sundays. I was like, seriously? She goes, oh yeah, she loves it when he shows up and he's taught her all sorts of things. And I begin to thank myself. Here's a guy who, who owns a business, a company that sells all over the nation. He's got a family of his own. He's busy running, trying to grow his company, and he takes time to teach four-year-old boys and girls about the love of Jesus. And Scott will have no idea this side of heaven, the impact that he's having on these four-year-olds as he begins to teach them about the love of Jesus. And you go, well, Chris, you know, I I'm, I'm, can't teach, or four-year-old's not my calling. It may not be, but, but that person, there's an impact that you can have with your life of faith. And if you keep hoping and praying and believing for the next generation, what God can do, you have no idea the impact that your faith can have. And Paul is writing to his, his spiritual son, Timothy, going, hang in there. Remember the faith of not only your mother, but of your grandmother. And then he writes this letter, and near the end, Paul recounts his own life of faith in chapter 4, verse 6. And Paul is an incredible example, and he just begins to unpack some things that he's done in, in his own life. And Paul writes in, in, in the perfect tense, and if you're an English teacher, you know what I'm talking about. If not, Google it. But anyway, chapter 4, verse 6. He says, as for me, this is Paul writing. He goes, as for me, to Timothy. He says, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. And he would know, it's very, very close. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And I have remained faithful. 
And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. It's the perfect tense because meaning he goes, I've already done these things. My life has already been poured out. The time of my death, it's near. He's writing in a dark, dingy, nasty prison, cave of a prison. And tradition tells us that he would die at the hands of Nero, more than likely beheaded. And so he knows the time of his death is near. And he goes, Timothy, my life has been poured out. And, and, and Timothy, if I can tell you, so he goes, fight the good fight and finish the race and remain faithful. And the reason why, Timothy, is because there's a crown of righteousness waiting on the other side of this. He goes, my life is, has already been poured out, has already been spent for the things that God has called me to do. And so as you begin to think about your own life and the model that, that you're living for the next generation, I would just love for us to begin to filter it through these three ideas that Paul filters his life through at the very end. Fight the good fight, finish the race, remain faithful. Fight the good fight. I love how... Paul doesn't mince words. He's telling Timothy, his, his young protege, listen, life is brutal. Life is a fight and you fight the good fight. And I love what the great theologian Mike Tyson always says. <laughs> Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And the truth is life will punch you in the mouth. If it hasn't already, just hang on. The uppercut is coming. And, and I love it because he goes, Timothy, it's a fight, but you fight the good fight or you fight the important fights. You do the important things that God has called you to do. And all of us in this room have fought the wrong fights. We fought the unimportant fights. We fought the fights that cause us sideways energy from the things God has called us to do. So a simple question to wrestle with is, are you fighting the good fight? Are you fighting the right fight, or is it unimportant? A couple of weeks ago, we we're sitting in an all-staff meeting, and I don't know why I asked this. Sometimes I just ask random questions, but I just asked them. I was like, hey, do y'all ever have dumb fights with your spouses? Like everybody in the circle started kind of not laughing and not. I go, great, share with us. And they're what? And so we went around the circle, and you need to know that our staff, just like many of you, we have really dumb fights when it comes with our spouses. Me personally, Brianna, we have fought over a Quiznos sub sandwich. You don't judge, you've got your own issues. One, one of our staff, he argued over a burrito. Another one of our staff, he and his spouse, they fight over him losing iPhone charger cables. I go, what? He goes, yeah, I just lose them all the time and I grab my wife's and she didn't like that. And so I, I go, you just lose them. I go, Where do they go? He's like, I don't know. I just lose them. I go, well, here's a little tip for you. I said, by the nightstand, I tie mine to the lamp so you don't lose it. <laughs> and his response, well, I would just lose the lamp. <laughs> We'd fight over that. <laughs> right, we, so we, we, you know what I'm talking about? When unimportant fights, unimportant things, but what if you begin to understand and begin to reprioritize the important things and fight the important, fight the good fights? Fight for your family and fight for your marriage and fight for your integrity and fight for your character. What if you went home today and said, you know what, for far too long we've been prioritizing the wrong things. We've been putting time toward the unimportant things. We've been putting our bank account toward the unimportant things. And starting today, I'm going to, going to begin to model life of faith for the future generations that are going to come up through my family. And I'm going to prioritize, and I know it's difficult, and I know it's painful, but I'm going to fight the good fights. Fight the good fight. And he says, finish the race. Finish the race. And you know this. You know that starting something is way easier than finishing something. Starting is easy. Starting is fun. It's flashy. You look really important. Finishing it is a whole nother thing. Finishing it takes work. Finishing it is not flashy. Finishing it is not this grandiose thing. Starting something, starting a race is great. 
finishing and finishing well takes work and takes effort and it oftentimes is painful and it's just ugly to get to the finish, but you finish the race and you finish it well. Starting is easy, finishing is a whole other story. And if you don't believe me, just go watch any 5K or 10K fun run. Just go watch any charity run, 5K or 10K. The starting line and finish line are two different stories. The starting line at a 5K, everybody's happy and they're eating bananas and they've got their hair combed and they've got the race t-shirt on and they're all fired up and this is gonna be great, fantastic. And everybody's cheering them on, gun goes off and they start. The finish line is a completely different story. You see some really ugly people running through the finish line. I mean, they're dripped in sweat and they're throwing up and they're just like barely making it. And you're going, was this the person that was there 30 minutes ago? Finishing, it's, it's, it's difficult. It takes effort. It takes work. But he goes, you finish and you finish well. And he goes, a life of faith is one that will finish the race. And how many times do we start something only to run into pain or frustration or heartache or disappointment and go, I'm done. I would, but I just got punched in the mouth by life. You fight the good fight and you finish the race, no matter what life throws your way. I had a great opportunity in college, one summer in college, to live next door to my great grandmother. Great grandmother was just a few doors down from her, and I just had a job in Dallas Fort Worth area. And I lived next to her, and I didn't have any friends there. And so I hung out with her pretty much every single day. And at this time, she was in her 90s. And a few years ago, I had the great honor of officiating her funeral. But I just remember that summer, and I got to know her just super, super close that summer. And this was a lady who lived through the Great Depression, who raised kids through the Great Depression, saw so many different wars, so many different presidents, so many different economies, and for the majority of her life, lived a very poor life, was not rich at all, very poor, but she was faithful until the end. And that summer she poured in, into me, her great grandson. At the end of the summer, she gave me this right here. Now, by a show of hands, how many of you know what, what this is right here, just by a show of hands, okay? Uh, it's a cast iron skillet. And if you're like under the age of 20, let me just tell you about this thing right here. <laughs> this is the greatest piece of cookware ever invented. You can go to your bed, bath, and beyond and look at all that fancy Teflon or whatever. This is the greatest piece of cookware ever invented. You go, why? Let me tell you why. First of all, it's a cast iron skillet. And that's just a great name for a piece of cookware. The second thing is, yes, you can bake or you can fry, or you can put it in the oven, you can do all that stuff, but you can do so much more. You can hammer a nail with this thing. <laughs> you can dig a ditch with it if you so choose. You can even use it in your CrossFit workouts. Man, are those kettlebells? No, no, no. These are cast iron skillets that we're doing. But, but, but she gave us, and almost every day she'd cook something in it, cornbread or whatever. She'd fry stuff in it. She gave it to me just as, you know, just as a souvenir. I guess in the summer she goes, here, it's yours. And me and Brianna, we use this almost every single week. And every time I look at it, I'm reminded of this sweet, white-haired great-grandmother that I lived next door to who finished the race well. And when she passed from this life into heaven, she heard the words, well done, good and faithful servant. She wasn't rich. She never stood on a stage, never wrote a book, but she faithfully followed Jesus and she finished the race. And that's what a life of faith is. It's understanding that it's a fight. And it's understanding that, man, sometimes life is going to hurt, but you remain faithful and you finish the race. And then the last four words, I want you to go back to verse seven. Last four words. Fought the good fight, I finished the race, and he says, and I have remained faithful. I have remained faithful. Timothy, 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 listen to me. My son, this is, this is probably my last words. The time of my death is near. Timothy, I've given all I have to God. I fought the good fight. Timothy, I, I finished the race. And Timothy, remain faithful. Don't waver. 
You set your eyes on the end goal. You start the race. You head toward the finish line and you don't deviate. You don't go to the left. You don't go to the right. You don't go when it's difficult. You bail out. You remain faithful. And how many times have we gone, you know what? It's a fight. I know that. There's a finish line. I'm headed toward it. And all of a sudden, it's pain. It's heartache. It's disappointment. And all of a sudden, you're going, if this is what following Jesus is like, I'm out. If this is what it means is when, when I go to church and all of a sudden, I'm in a small group. And then all of a sudden, I get fired for no reason. If that's what this means, I'm out. I think it was Timothy. Remain faithful. And notice Paul, he's writing from a dark, stinky, nasty dungeon. Paul's not writing from a country club. He's not writing from a retirement community. He's not writing from a golf course or on the ski slopes or out on the lake. He's writing from a prison. It doesn't finish life with his feet up and going, man, this is fantastic. He finishes going, this is it. I'm not sure how much longer I have, but Timothy, remain faithful. You hang in there. It is a good fight. You finish the race. And Timothy, do not waver to the left or to the right. Stay faithful. And some of you, you're, you're going along and there's this ugly, glaring thing of life looking right at you in the temptation to go, if this is what it means, I'm out Stay faithful. You have no idea what your life of faith, how it will impact the future generations of your family. And you're one decision away from that son or daughter, grandson or granddaughter, niece or nephew, looking at you going, I can't believe they hung in there. I can't believe they stayed faithful. You have no idea what your life of faith, how it will impact future generations. My father, when he was in his 20s in college, he lost his older brother to a, in a tragic trucking accident. His older brother was about three or four years older than him, drove 18 wheelers for a living and just was in a massive accident and just killed instantly. My father's told me this story ever since I can remember. But he says he, he got the call when he was in college, drove back home and he's there with his mom and his dad and, and his sister, my aunt. And they're grieving and processing. And, and his older brother passed away on a Friday, two days before Mother's Day. And they're there. And he said, Chris, he goes, he passed away on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. He goes, two days later, he says, all of us were on the second row at church. My father, he said, my mother, he said, my sister and me, we were there. And he says, I looked down and he goes, his father, my grandfather, he goes, he just never cried. But he was there and they're singing the hymns. And he goes, I just see a tear streaming down his cheek. And he goes, and he stood there and he sung the hymns. And then he sat and he listened to the preacher. And they finished and got up and left. He says, I asked my dad, he goes, why did we do this, dad? And he looked at me, he goes, son, this is what our family does. We go to church. I thought, Two days earlier to lose your oldest son in a horrific accident. And then two days later to be seated on the second row, worshiping your heavenly father. It would be every temptation to all of us to go, if this is it, I'm out. If this is what life is going to be coming toward me, then I'm done. I'm walking away from the faith. But you remain faithful. It's a fight, but you fight the good fights. You finish the course and you remain faithful no matter what. And all of this can really boil down to two very simple questions as you begin to think about the next generations in your family and wanting them to leave functional, godly lives and then really your own life. The first question I wrote down was this. Who has God placed in your life? Who has God placed in your life? And my hope is, as our time today here draws to a close, that there's been somebody that God's been putting on the top of your mind. And maybe it's that younger sibling, if you're a high schooler, maybe it's the middle schooler, maybe it's that kid that's always over at your house five nights a week. Maybe it's your son-in-law or your daughter-in-law 
or that person at work that you've adopted really as your own spiritual son or your spiritual daughter, that person in your life, who has God placed in your life, that next generation? And the second question is this, what example are you giving them? What example are you giving them? Are you living a life of faith that you want them to follow? Are you fighting the good fight? Sorry, are you finishing the race? Are you remaining faithful the way that you would want them to? What example are you giving them to follow? Because the truth of the matter is they're watching, whether they say it or not. They're gonna see how you react to things. But when you pass away, they're gonna look at your journal, your Bible. They're gonna see what you wrote down. Is your life a life of faith that you want them to model? Are you fighting the right fights? Are you finishing the right races and finishing them well? And are you remaining faithful? Because you have no idea the impact that your life of faith can have on future generations. I'll finish with Psalms chapter 78. And I was going over my message this week with Brianna and talking about things. And she reminded me of something that happened about two years ago two years ago in, in September. And uh, she goes, you remember this? And, and, and I most certainly did. But it's one of those deals where just as the husband, you, you compartmentalize it. But two years ago, uh, my grandmother passed away. And she was one of these ladies that when you met her, she would become your second mom like that. And she and Brianna were extremely, extremely close. And we, we lived with her for about six months while we were building a house. I mean, they just became very, very close. And she, she passed away pretty suddenly two years ago. And on the same day that we buried my grandmother, Brianna had a miscarriage. And so you can imagine all the emotions of that day processing through that. She goes, do you remember? I go, oh, most certainly do. And she says, there is a verse, some verses in Psalms that help me get through that. Help me process my, my grandmother, death, the miscarriage, and then, and then how, how to, to move forward. In Psalm 78, starting in verse three, she read these to me this week, and so these are Brianna's verses. Verse three says, I will teach you hidden lessons from our past, stories we have heard and known Stories our ancestors handed down to us. And she goes, Chris, that reminds me of your grandmother and the stories that she passed on to us and the life of faith that she passed on to us. And it continues, verse four. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. For he issued his laws to Jacob. He gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to, to teach them to their children. So the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born. And they in turn will teach their own children. So each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. You have no idea how your life of faith will impact future generations. Generations that, that you'll never know, but because of what you prayed for, what you believed in, how you remained faithful, how you fought the good fights, how you finished well. You have no idea what your life of faith, how it will impact your children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and the generations beyond. And so I would just simply ask, who has God placed in your life? And what example are you giving them? Give them the life of faith to fight the good fight, to finish the race, and remain faithful. Let me pray for us. God, my prayer, Lord, is that you'd bring people into our lives it's so easy, God, to get focused on ourselves, on our own life. And Lord, my prayer is that we would begin to see the future generations as examples to, to live for, examples to set so they could see our life of faith. And they may never say anything, but they observe it. So Lord, my prayer 
is that all of us would fight the good fight, that we would finish the race and we would remain faithful, that we'd keep praying for, hoping, and believing in the next generation and the generation after that. God, go before us, guide us, bring people into our lives and let us live a life of faith. In Jesus' name, amen.